Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We'll be hearers and doers of it. We thank you for the fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We began sharing with you this morning on the subject of the revelation of the work, uh, how Satan works against you to try to bring his destructive works. And we're going to pick up with the next verse. We're not going to review what we talked about. So we got much to move forward on. So we talked about many principles. I invite you to listen to the message that we brought forth this morning. We begin here this evening in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. He turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Here he's speaking to Peter. And what was happening here? This is where back in verse 21, Jesus was showing the disciples here how he was to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and how he's going to be raised again the third day. Of course, they didn't understand these things. Peter took him, began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And that's when he turned to Peter, but look what he was speaking to. He was speaking to the devil. That means the devil can operate in people. The devil can be in people through evil spirits, and the devil can operate through people that are not yielding to the Lord. And they're speaking what they want. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. That means the, the devil seeks to lead someone to stumble and to not walk in the ways of the Lord. For thou savorest. This is a word which refers to having a mindset that is not right. He was minding not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. If you mind the things that be of men, you're going to be yielding to the enemy. We cannot be minding the things that be of men. We are to mind the things that be of God. The devil will try to get you to regard and mind the things of carnal man and what you want to do and all these other things that would be contrary to what God wants instead of listening to the Lord. We must deny ourselves. We must put the word of God first place. And this shows us that Satan can speak through people who yield to the things of men instead of God. That's why when you speak, be sure you're speaking in line with the word. Don't give your opinion. Don't speak what you want. You could be yielding to the enemy. You might have good intentions, but speaking something that is not of the Lord whatsoever. We are not to mind these things of carnal mind. Instead, we are to deny ourselves, and we are to follow the way of the Lord. We go on, and Jesus then said to his disciples in this context, then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me, now we pointed out in the past, but I'll point it out again, Will is the main verb in this clause, as it is in the present tense, indicative mood, which is the statement, the main verb in the clause. The word come is an infinitive in the Greek. An infinitive would be translated to come. King James, you never figure that out. But when you look in the Greek, you understand that. Or when you look at Young's, Young's was faithful to translate things correctly. He says, if any man doth will to come after me, you set your will to come after him, means you're, not, you're denying yourself. You're not going to walk in your own ways. He said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's what God wants. He wants you to deny yourself. He wants you to take up your cross, crucify on the flesh, and follow him, putting the word of God first place, and do what he wants you to do. We can't let anything cause us to stumble or sin or miss the mark on what God has for us to do. In fact, we see a scripture over in Romans 16, in verse 17, where it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, the same word. Those that cause offenses or, or cause you to stumble or sin or not do the things God wants, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. In other words, you don't want to listen to a doctrine from men, commandments of men, things that would be of divisions, cause divisions and offenses contrary to the truth that you've learned. No, you want to avoid them. 
That's why, again, we have to check out everything, be good Bereans, and search the scriptures to see if the things are so, because we don't want to be yielding to what man thinks. We only want to be yielding to what the Lord thinks. So you've got to watch that you make sure you put the word first place, and you don't let the enemy have place by you just kind of reasoning in your mind or saying whatever you think. Anytime you do that, you're going to cause people to sin and stumble, and you're doing it yourself. You will not perceive things properly, and Satan will actually be operating in you and through you. We see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, the devil's the one who comes to try to tempt us and to get us not to walk in the ways of the Lord. Matthew 26, 41, he said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Who's the tempter? It's the devil. So he will try to get you through temptation not to walk in his ways. Notice he said, the spirit indeed is willing. This means ready and willing. Your spirit is always ready and willing to do the right thing. But the flesh is weak. It's strengthless. Can you ever rely on the human nature, on the flesh, your carnal mind, your own way of thinking? No. You can only rely on that which is of the Spirit. And what's going to come out of the Spirit? That which is going to be in line with the Word of God. Your Spirit is always ready and willing to do what's right. But you are going to have to watch spiritually and pray so that you are built up in the Spirit and ready to speak the Word against the temptations. Because the devil would like to get you to enter into the temptation. Of course, the devil would like you to appeal to the flesh in some way because he knows that you aren't going to be able to overcome the temptations if you do so. You've got to get strong in spirit, learn to spiritually watch and be discerning properly and pray and be ready to do what the Word says so you don't yield to the flesh. We see something else over in the parable of the sower, and we're going to be spending some time on this because it's important to see what the devil seeks to do. We'll be looking in Mark 4, Matthew 13, and Luke chapter 8 as we're looking at this aspect of how Satan would seek to work against you. In Mark 4, 15, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. The word gets sown when you hear it. It says, when they've heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. The devil comes to try to take the word out of your heart. That shows you the word gets in your heart every time you hear it, but it also shows you that Satan will be active against the word because he knows the word is the power of God that will produce the promises, and the Holy, Holy Spirit will bring revelation to that word if you take hold of it and do what he says. So, you've got to be on guard when you hear the word so the enemy does not take it out of your heart, which means you need to take hold of it and do what the word says. And that is going to be very important. As we see over in Matthew's account, in chapter 13, we pick up in verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, God wants you to get the spiritual understanding of it. You will get the understanding when you do what the word says, you receive it, and to incorporate it in your lifestyle and be applying it, the Holy Spirit will bring revelation to you. Then cometh the wicked one, catch the way that was sown in his heart. Why can he get it away? Because you didn't understand it. You didn't do what it said. If you do what the word says, God will bring you understanding. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. The light will come. This is why you can't just be a hearer only. You need to be doing the word, and God will bring revelation to those who are doers of the word of God. That scripture we're referring to, that till you understand this principle, John 3 21, he that doeth truth cometh to the light. You're going to get light when you do the word of God. We see over in Luke's account, in chapter 8, we pick up over here, and we see in verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. You see, if you believe that word, and you act upon it, you do what it says, because when he talks about here, about someone, whether they would believe this is something that they're going to do actively, believing on it, and be saved, which will produce the salvation of the Lord, or the healing of the Lord, um, that God is going to accomplish, 
it is something that's conditional upon you doing what the word says of believing. And also the passive voice indicates the salvation is going to come from the Lord. That's because you're acting on the word. And this word not only means to be saved, but it means to be safe, to be sound, uh, to be well, to be healed, to be restored to health. It's God accomplishing his great work to bring forth his salvation, healing, prosperity, blessing, protection for you in your life. So the devil doesn't want that. He wants to get the word out of your heart. That's why they must understand Satan's activity is to try to take the word out. He does not want you to get the understanding. That's why when the word comes to you, God wants you to be a doer of that word so that then God will bring revelation to you and you will see the fruit of it as you incorporate it into your lifestyle. He goes on to verse 16 in Mark 4. These are they which likewise are sown on stony ground, who when they've heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. They take hold of it with gladness. They obviously are applying this in their life. They've got spiritual understanding of it. They're beginning to incorporate in their lifestyle. But they have no root in themselves. Oh, they like what they heard, but they haven't been doing this consistently. The root system is established by hearing and doing the word. As you get that established in you, then you won't be moved. When the plant has the root system established, doesn't matter what comes against it, it's not going to be moved. But until that root system established, you can get taken up pretty easily. You need to get the root system established in you because you hear and you do the word. You commit to do the word consistently. Because they have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time, what's going to happen? When the devil comes with his pressure, if you're not committed to do the word and haven't been doing it, he's going to attack. And what does he bring? He brings affliction, which is pressure. He will try to bring pressure against you to stop you from doing the Word of God. It'll come from what the enemy's attack against you. It could be coming in your mind. It could be coming from evil spirits within. It could be coming from situations, circumstances, pressing you, trying to hinder you. Or from persecution, which is trying to put you to flight. That's where the devil uses people to try to get from the outside to persecute you, to get you not to continue to do the Word. And why do these things come? They arise for the Word's sake, not because of you. It's because of what's in you, the Word that's in you. And what happens? If they do not have root in themselves, then they'll get offended. They will be stumbling and they will be walking away from the Word. They will not continue to do what the Word says. In Matthew's account, we see in chapter 13, we pick up over here, verse 20. He that received the seed into stony places, the same that hear the word, and now with joy receives it. He took hold of this, yet he's not root himself. He endures for a while, tribulation, persecution arise because of the word again. By and by, he gets offended. He gets offended and he turns away from the word. In Luke's account, Luke chapter 8, we pick up over there. Here it says, They on the rock are they which hear, they receive the word with joy. And this also tells us something, because the word receive here is a different Greek word. It's the word dekamai. This also tells you what's important for you when the word comes to you, how you receive it. The word lambano that we saw in the other ones means to take hold of it and apply it in your life. The word dekamai is a passive reception where you are ready to receive what's coming to you. That means whenever the word's coming to you, you should be ready to accept it and also take hold of it and put it in operation. You don't play pick and choose, well, I don't want to hear that. No, you need to be ready to receive it, but do more than that, take hold of it to apply it in your life with joy. These have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, they fall away. The word fall away isn't really the best word because it's a word meaning to stand off or withdraw, they chose to stand away. That meant they didn't continue in it. It's not like they accidentally fell away. No, they chose to stand away, to withdraw is what that meant. Because they fell for the temptation. Because if, as you hear and do the word, you'll get strong against the temptation. You'll be able to resist it. But if not, the pressure of the enemy will get to you and it would cause them to stand away. Many people back off when the pressure comes. That's the devil bringing the pressure. Anything that's trying to get you to compromise or back off the word, that's the devil 
attacking you. And remember what he's doing. He's attacking the word on the inside of you because he does not want it to bring forth fruit in your life. We go back to Mark chapter 4, and now we come here to verse 18. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. The cares of this world is another thing that the devil will use. The cares, care means anxieties. The anxieties, the cares, the worries, the concerns of this age is what it really means, not world, it's not cosmos, it's aeon. The cares, anxieties of this age, which is because of the God of this age, who is the devil, and the deceitfulness of riches, where he wants to get your eyes on riches, things, possessions, and also the lusts or strong desire of other things instead of doing what the Word says. If they enter in, they'll choke the Word, and it will become unfruitful. Meaning the Word doesn't automatically produce fruit in your life. It is supposed to produce fruit in your life, and it will if you do what's necessary. This is what the devil will use. He wants you to get full of care, worry, anxiety. See, the Bible says be anxious for nothing. What should we do? Cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. Don't let yourself get full of care, worry, anxiety in any situation. That's the enemy working to choke the word or the deceitfulness of riches, thinking that that's going to be a source for me. No, you need to do what the Lord says. Don't get your eyes on other things or the lusts of other things, strong desire for them entering in. It will choke the word and become unfruitful. In Matthew's account, you see over here, Matthew chapter 13, we see down here in verse 22, he that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care, anxiety of this age, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. In Mark 4 it said it becomes unfruitful. This one is talking about you. In other words, as the word is fruitful, so are you fruitful. If the word's not fruitful in you, you're not fruitful. You're only as fruitful as the word that is working in your life. So the devil, he doesn't want you to be fruitful. He wants to get the word out of you. Many Christians go through their entire life and they hardly have any fruit because the word is not operating in them. And we come over here to verse 14 of Luke 8. They which fell among thorns are they which, when they've heard, they go forth and are choked with cares, anxieties, riches, wealth. See, wealth can get your eyes on possessions and money and those things instead of on the Lord as your source. And pleasures of this life, pleasures of this bios. The devil would like you to seek after the pleasures of this life because it will get you off of what the Word says. You seek after those things instead of seeking after the things that are important. And what happens if you do that? You'll bring no fruit to perfection. Fruit is to come to perfection. Many people start out and the word is starting to work and then it never comes to perfection in their life. They don't see the results of it. And they wonder why. It's because they have let something stop it and choke it out so it doesn't produce results. So. We got to be ready to guard ourselves against these attacks. So we go back over to Mark and we see what's going to bring the results to conquer the enemy's attacks that are against us. We see back in Mark chapter 4, verse 20 These are they which are sown on good ground. They hear the word, God wants you to hear the word. They receive the word. Paradecomai means they took hold of it near. They ready or accepted it to themselves. Para means come bring it near. And they bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. It'll be little by little by little. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. 30, 60, 100-fold. As you hear and do the word, you'll bring forth more fruit. God wants you to be exceedingly fruitful. But this is going to be because you hear the word, you do it, you apply it in your life consistently. We see over in um, Luke's account here, Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, we see over in verse um, 15, they on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart. We must have an honest and a good heart. If your heart's not right, you're not going to see anything happen. 
honest heart is one that is a beautiful heart or holy before him. A good heart is one that is going to be upright because of the word in your heart and you're walking right before the Lord. Having heard the word, they keep it. it means you're going to have to retain it. This word means to retain it. Because remember, the devil's trying to take it out. You've got to hold on to it. You've got to retain the word in you. How do you do that? By hearing and doing it consistently. And they bring forth fruit with patience. This tells us another aspect of what's important. You must have patience. What is patience? Patience is the Greek word hupomone, which means steadfastness and being constant. You're to be steadfast and constant on the word. You can't just be doing it one minute and then you're off another direction the next minute. And what is this talking about? Where does patience operate? Patience operates in the soulish realm. Because remember, the warfare against the enemy, or the, excuse me, the enemy brings against you is in the soul. He's attacking you in the mind or the will or the emotions. Luke 21, 19, in your patience, in your steadfastness and constancy, you will possess your souls you will have control of the soulless realm so the devil does not get to you. So what, what does the devil do? He doesn't want you to understand the word. He doesn't want you to get some roots established in you by hearing and doing the word and getting established in it. He didn't want you to believe at all, but if you believe for a while, as long as you don't keep believing and bring forth the fruit to perfection, he will bring pressure against you he will also try to bring persecution from without to get you to back off the word in some way. He wants you to get offended, stumble, sin, turn away from continuing it. He will bring temptations against you. He will use care, worry, anxiety about things. Also, deceitfulness of riches get you off on other things instead of doing the word. Or lust, strong desires for other things to enter in and seek after the desire for pleasure. The pleasures of this life which is what the world seeks after. If so, it will choke the word and you and it will become unfruitful and you'll bring no fruit to perfection. That's what Satan comes to do. But the answer is for you to hear the word, do, have a ready reception for it, take hold of it to apply it in your life, be a consistent doer of it. You will gain the spiritual understanding as you apply it in your life and you do it consistently. You will get a root system established it will become a part of your lifestyle. You will walk in it and you will not be yielding to the pressure or the attacks that come against you. You do have to guard yourself against cares, worries, and anxiety. Cast all the cares upon the Lord. Do not let anything deceive you away from doing what the Word says. You believe the Word, you act on it, it will produce the promises in your life as long as you meet the conditions. You've got to have an excellent good heart and you've also got to be able to retain the Word and be steadfast in the soulish realm, because the warfare will come against you. So in summary, what Satan does, he comes after the word. He tries to block you from getting understanding. He doesn't want you to have a ready reception for it. He likes you just to pick and choose. Well, I don't want to hear that, or I like to hear that. That's not the way you approach God's word. He doesn't want you to take hold of it and apply it your life. That is mandatory. You just don't hear the word and, and say, well, that's nice in information. He expects you to take hold of it and put it in operation. He wants you to continually believe and endure in the midst of anything. Never get offended over the word and stand away. Oh, and that's a mistake. You've got to be ready to deal with the pressure that comes at you. No worry, no anxiety. These are all things that he brings against you. And you're going to have to retain the word. Realize the battle is against the word. That's why when you hear a message and all of a sudden it seems like, where'd all these attacks come from? That's the devil coming against the word. He's trying to get you to back off it and not do what the word says. If you'll be steadfast, you will see the fruit come forth. We see another thing about how the devil will work against you. Mark chapter 5, verse 35. This is the man who was the Jairus, was the synagogue here, the ruler of the synagogue. And in Mark 5, 35, He'd already had been, had come to Jesus, and Jesus was on his way to heal his daughter with, who was at the point of death. Verse 35, in the meantime, he ministered to the woman who had the issue of blood, and she got healed. Verse 35, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter's dead. Here he's on the way to heal her. She already was at the point of death, and here's the report. 
the daughter's dead. Well, does that mean it's all over? And then here's the temptation from the devil that comes. Why troublest thou the master any further? Essentially, give up and go home. It's over. Your daughter's finished. No. What did Jesus say immediately? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. What this tells you is if even if circumstances change, regardless of what the situation is, does that change what God's going to do? Is that going to change his word, the promises, and what he says he will do in your life? No. He is a performer of his word. It doesn't matter what the report is. The evil report from the doctor or whatever the situation might be. Don't ever fall for the lie of giving up. The devil will try to get you to back off of believing the word and doing what the word says. He says, be not afraid. That means fear is trying to get a hold of you. Fear will cause you to back off. Faith, you'll never back off. You believe. You continue to believe. This guy continued to believe, and he saw his daughter got raised from the dead. God wants you to never fall for the attacks of the enemy. Any negative reports from the natural, contrary to the word of God, they're trying to put fear in you. They're trying to think, you, oh, it's not going to work. They try to put doubt in you, get you to waver, anything, he'll, anything to get you out of faith. That's the devil. Do not give up. You continue in faith. You continue and you believe and no fear. If you will continue to believe, you will see as you go forth doing what he says, you will see him bring forth the promise, even if he has to raise you or raise somebody from the dead. He accomplishes his great works. Praise God. That's what God wants. Now we see also over in Luke chapter 4, understanding about how evil spirits can influence a person's life. Because the devil operates through evil spirits that come in from an open door of sin. Luke chapter 4, verse 33. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. That means demons can be in a person and they can speak out of their mouth. It happens at times. Not a good thing. We don't want to hear what the devil has to say. But they can be in a person and they can speak out of a person and even do evil things. Let us alone. What are we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? Come to destroy us. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus began to cast him out, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And then what happened? The devil thrown him in the midst. He came out of him and hurt him not. That meant the devil did throw at him. That means the devil can manifest in ways that are unpleasant. He might manifest with his pain. He might manifest with some kind of pressure. I love the people in the midst of casting out, they get all this head pain, headache pain or whatever, or they feel, they feel all this pressure or whatever. I had a woman just this past week, and I've had them in the past, where we were casting out the demons, and their hands froze up. Their hands manifest, the demons were manifest, and just in the midst of the attack that was going on, the devils were fighting, and it even caused their hand to kind of freeze up. Well, we continued to cast out, until and then that kind of began to, to release out. I've worked with other people in the past where you just keep casting out until all the spirits are gone. But they can manifest. They can do these kind of things, even throw a person down. Of course, the answer is to get them out as quickly as possible. And if you work on getting the demons coming out and you get the person, get them releasing out, especially get them coughing out, which helps to get them coming out, that will stop manifestations mostly. But there can be times when demons will manifest. So don't let that deter you from deliverance. Deliverance is a good thing. You want 99% of the people don't have any of these kinds of problems. It's just a matter of you consistently casting them out. And the key is we don't want them to manifest in any adverse way. That's why when you're working on yourself or working on other people, commanding the spirits to come out, if you ever sense anything seem to be going on in you, immediately cough out with deep breathy coughs as you cast out. It'll get the spirits releasing out of you and shut down the manifestations. We've seen that happen numerous, many, just dozens and dozens and dozens of times over the years. <laughs> Luke chapter 8, verse 2. Certain women which have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, God will bring healing to you. And it's not just going to be healing you of infirmities, physical things. 
but it's also healing of evil spirits. This is why deliverance is one thing, healing is another. God wants you to cast out the demons, getting rid of the evil spirits. He also wants you to take hold of healing. Healing belongs to you. It is part of the promises of God, and he wants you to drive these spirits out of you. At the same time, you also need to understand, demons can be in a person for a long time. Don't just wonder, well, how'd this demon get in me, you know? It might have been in you for a long time. It might have been in you from inheritance. Look what it says in Luke 8, 27. When they went forth the land, they met him out of the city, a certain man which had devils a long time. And these devils were doing such crazy things to him that he would run around with no clothes or didn't abide in any house, and he was in the tombs. That's an extreme case where someone is so evil, uh, the demons are working so strong against the person. But notice, you can have demons for a long time. That doesn't mean just because you've had them for a long time that you can't get rid of them. You can get rid of them. You have authority and dominion. You can cast them out. Remember, how have we gotten demons? They've come in from the open door of sin any time in your life. And where have they come in initially? From inheritance. Remember that the iniquities of the fathers are visited upon the children of the third and fourth generation. All of us have spirits that came in at the time of conception from day one, and they are working to bring forth these particular problems uh, from evil spirits, whether it's physical, mental, emotional. We see else happen with children uh, many times that have all these problems from day one, mental problems and so forth. Or we see it in physical problems even that show up then, or later in life people have these problems and they wonder, well, how did I get that? Well, oh yeah, it was in the inheritance line. Everybody had this problem, diabetes, heart problems, cancer, whatever it might be. And so these spirits were in you for, from the beginning. This is why, of course, deliverance is so important for everybody. Once you come to the Lord, you need to not only get born again, receive the Holy Spirit, uh, get your prayer language, get involved in the Word, walking in the Word, growing and developing, but you need to get involved in deliverance right away. Deliverance is important to start casting out the demons and get set free from the bondages of the enemy. These evil spirits can also have spiritual, supernatural strength. This is why you've got to bind these demons. You have authority to bind them to stop their works. But here's where it talks about the demon where he was able to break the bands and, and driven to the devil in the wilderness. Demons have supernatural strength and they can do things, but you have authority. You can bind them. You can stop their works and drive them out. And you can also see demons can have a tremendous number. Tremendous number. This is a guy who had a legion of demons. What was a legion? A legion was 6,826 men. I meant this guy had 6,826 demons that were in him. You can have an unlimited number of demons. It all depends on what's come in from the inheritance line. And, of course, what's the answer for all this? To cast out the demons. So we talked about this verse this morning, but we'll talk about it again this evening. This is important for you. Everybody needs deliverance. Deliverance is a good thing. Jesus wants everybody to cast out demons. It's the first sign following the believer. Casting out the demons is one aspect of you to get free. It's not the total answer. You must understand that. It says in verse 35, They went out to see what was done, Luke 8, 35, came to Jesus, found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Notice, this is more than just telling you some physical facts. There's a spiritual revelation here. The demons were cast out of him. Notice what else. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus. What is that significant? The sitting here is a present tense verb, present tense participle, which means ongoing action, which tells you something. Who else was sitting at the feet of Jesus? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. What was she doing? Hearing the word of God, remember? So this is talking about this guy as the demons were cast out. What else did he need to do? He needed to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear the word continuously. That's what you need. And what's the result of you hearing the word continuously? It, as you take hold of it and apply it, it will cause you to be spiritually clothed. Because that's the next thing. He was clothed. And this is a word which is a perfect tense in the Greek. The perfect tense refers to action completed in the past 
with present effects at the time of speaking. So what it's saying is, as he was continually hearing the word sitting at the feet of Jesus, the result is the action gets completed of him getting spiritually clothed, God's word is spiritual revelation, and continuing in the present effect at that time of speaking. Otherwise, he got, he got clothed with all the things that God wants. God wants you to get clothed with the garments of God through the word in you and then have it continually be operating in your life. And then what's the result? He's in his right mind. The reason why we say this and why you see this here, many people have just cast out the demons, but then they haven't gotten well. They've come back into them. Why? Because they didn't get the word in them. As you get the word in you, you'll not only understand the truth so you walk now in the truth, you also correct the problems that, have, that allow the spirits to come in to begin with, which you have to, because if you continue in sin, you're going to get in worse shape. And also, you come to the place of being spiritually clothed, which is the same we're talking about when you get clothed. That's what you do when you put on the whole armor of God. You're actually clothing yourself spiritually so that you are going to be able to walk in the ways of the Lord. You have the power of God in you, able to conquer attacks. And then what was the result? This guy was in his right mind. Why? Because he now was walking in line with the word. And that's what God wants for you. So what are we going to do if we do have these demons, by the way? We're going to destroy their works. How? Luke 9, 1. He called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. That's the word dunamis. And authority. The word exousia. It's correctly translated here. Over all devils and to cure diseases. You have authority over all devils. Don't think that you can't cast all devils out. Not just some. You can cast them all out. I don't care how strong they are. You have authority. The greater one is in you, and you can conquer every work of the enemy. So you've got to know the devil will try to deceive you and make you think that you can't cast out all devils. He's a liar. You have authority and power over all devils, and you are to cast them out and also to cure diseases. That's what God wants. It wasn't just for the 12 disciples. In Luke chapter 10, we see down here in verse 17, the 70 also were appointed and sent forth. They returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They were casting out the demons as well. You and I are believers today, and we can cast out the demons. In fact, Mark 16, 17 says, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. You have authority. God wants you to cast all the demons out, to drive them out of every area of your life. So the devil doesn't want you to know about this, and he doesn't want you to do it. If you know about it, but you don't do it, it's just like you don't know about it because you're not getting anywhere. We need to be a doer of the word and engaging in spiritual warfare of casting out the spirits to drive them out of every area of our life. Look what also it says here in verse 18. He said to them, I beheld, this is Jesus responding to them saying how the demons were coming out when he would, they would command them to come out in the name, his name. So he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. What's this talking about? When it speaks here about him beholding this was Jesus observing what was going on in the realm of the spirit because it's an imperfect tense, which means he was seeing action in the past, what was going on as they were casting him out with the results at the time of speaking. He, was, he had discerning, was seeing what was going on, meaning that as they were casting out the demons, they were coming out. That also implies that it's a process because it was ongoing action in the past. It is a process. And then, when it says here, it's not a good way of translating here, so Satan as lightning fall from heaven, you think he's falling, Satan is coming down from heaven. But this is really what it speaks of. I was beholding the adversary as lightning from the heaven, having fallen. That's the way it would be translated in the Greek. Otherwise, he's falling as lightning from heaven. Lightning from heaven is like suddenly. That's what it's speaking of. So as the demons are being cast out and leaving and falling, they're coming 
like lightning from heaven. That's really what it's talking about. Not like he's falling from heaven where he's at, but, but it's lightning from heaven that he is falling. And when it talks about this falling, it's interesting. This word pipto means to descend from a higher place to a lower. That means Satan's control, which is higher when you begin to cast him out, as you cast him out, he is going from a higher place in you to a lower place in you. Meaning that as you're casting him out, you are progressing regardless of whether you see change in the natural or not. As you are winning the battle in the spirit, you are driving these enemies out. Well, they're going to fight against you, though. You may not see. You might even see. It seems like there's more warfare coming against me when I'm casting out. Well, that's the rest of the demons are fighting against you. But in the spirit, they are descending in their authority, in their operation against you, because they're descending from a higher place to a lower place of, of operation in, in the spirit operated in your life. That means that you are progressing. Don't ever think that you're not progressing when you're casting out. You, the demons are being driven out. They are descending from a stronger place to a lower place in you, and you're going to see the victory come forth in your life. And then he comes down to verse 19, and he says, Behold, I give unto you exousia, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the dunamis, power of the enemy. What's that tell you? That means Satan has power. But it takes authority, and in Luke 9, 1, it said authority and power, because you have a spirit of power, as well as authority delegated to you through the name of Jesus. You also have power resident in you through the word. So you're going to use the power of God resident within you and the authority delegated to you to cast these demons out. And you've got authority over all the power. That means, it doesn't matter what the enemy's doing, you can get rid of them. You must believe that and know that. Don't ever think that anything is too strong for you. It's a lie. You don't believe those. That's the devil trying to deceive you from believing the truth. Notice what it says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. And we pointed this out before, but we'll point it out again. That is not a statement of fact. The statement of fact is, behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. That's a statement of fact. Well, what about this, nothing shall by any means hurt you? It is not a statement of fact because it is a conditional statement. Because it is a subjunctive mood verb. In other words, it should not say nothing shall by any means hurt you, that it's automatically going to happen. Instead, it would be translated nothing might by any means hurt you as a subjunctive mood, as a conditional statement, meaning that you, meet, you have to meet the conditions for this to happen. Because the subjunctive mood is a conditional mood, is a conditional statement. It's otherwise, it's not something that automatically that they're not going to hurt you. You've got to use your authority against the power of the enemy. And then, having met the conditions, then nothing will be able to hurt you because you've met the conditions. Otherwise, you've got to engage in this warfare and use your authority against the power of the enemy. Continue to cast them out. If you do that, and you are continue until they're underfoot and eliminated, you won't have anything hurting you in your life. And then he goes on in verse 20, he says, Notwithstanding this, rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you. The sp evil spirits are subject unto you. Of course, don't get, all, uh, get your eyes on that, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Why am I rejoicing? Because my name's written in heaven. Well, that means you're right with God. That means you're born again. That means you're saved. And because you're saved, that's why you can cast them out. Otherwise, because the casting demons out shows you're right with God. You couldn't cast them out if you weren't right with God. Your names are written in heaven, meaning you're born again. And that's what we rejoice in, the fact that now we are right with the Lord. And because of that, that's how we can cast out the demons. We see another place talking about how the enemy works. Luke 16, 13, verse 16. Well, let's go back up to verse 11 first. Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. Notice, it wasn't just a physical infirmity. It was a spirit of infirmity. Spirit, infir infirmities, whether it's a weakness, whether it's physical ailments, or whether it's a problem like in this case where it was in her back, 
this is evil spirits that are doing this. A spirit of infirmity, 18 years, you can have it a long time, as we said. She was bowed together. That shows you that demons can cause a physical effect, even though it's just a spirit. It was causing her to be bowed together. She could in no wise lift up herself. She was walking around like a hunchback, essentially. She couldn't stand up and straighten herself out because it wasn't a physical problem. It was an evil spirit that was doing it. And when it says that she was having a spirit, this is a word echo, and this is a word meaning that was an ongoing effect in her life. And the reason I show you this, many people were thinking that maybe she just had this spirit on the outside of her, just holding on to her. But no, this is a spirit that was in her. The reason is because we see this word echo. We'll come back to this in a moment. But I want you to look when it speaks about a demon in Acts chapter 8, verse 7. Unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. They had demons in them. I put the cursor over the word possessed. It's the same word, echo, meaning they came out of many that were having demons within them. Having demons within you means they're possessing an area of control in either your soul and or body doing something. In this case, they, had, they were possessing control such that she couldn't lift up straight. She couldn't do it. There's nothing she could do until the spirit got eliminated. We also see the same thing uh, in, over in Acts chapter 16 when it's talking about, again, this demon that was possessing this one with the spirit of divination. It's the same word, echo, showing the fact that in Luke 13, where many people have thought it was just a spirit just affecting it from the outside, no. It was a spirit that was on the inside. She was having possessed with a spirit of infirmity that was in her, not on the outside. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Now, the reason why I bring this out, because you need to understand what needs to be done to get rid of the spirit. If that spirit's in her, as we pointed out, how do you get rid of it? You cast it out. Well, wait a minute. Here he's saying about loosing. That's not casting out. What's that all about? Did he just say you're loosed and that was it and it was gone? No, because what does it mean when she said, he said, woman, thou art loosed? Did he actively declare, I loose you from this right now, which is what a lot of people do out there in the body of Christ? That's a mistake. Look why. When I put the cursor over the word loosed, it is a perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek, as we were mentioning earlier, is past action completed. So he's saying, woman, you have been loosed in the past, the past action completed. Well, wait a minute. At the moment when he came to her, she was bowed over with his demon in her and couldn't lift up herself straight. So he can't be talking about getting rid of the infirmity at that point, he's talking about something else. He said, you already have been loosed or untied from this spirit of infirmity in the past with present effects, meaning whatever happened in the past was presently in force to help you right now. What's he talking about? The other thing that's a key, he said it's passive voice. If Jesus was saying that and untying her, it would be an active thing, wouldn't it? I loose you, that'd be active. He wasn't doing that. He's saying about someone else or something else loosed you from this in the past because it's passive voice, meaning it's not the subject doing it, which was Jesus. Something else was acting to cause this to be in the, pa uh, the passive voice. Someone else was acting to be, cause this to be the state of being loosed. What is it talking about? It literally says, woman, you have been loosed, untied from this infirmity, when? Because of the covenant relationship that they had in the past, which brought them to, gave them the right to be free from this, and the present effect was, this is a covenant promise. This is a covenant right that's already been given to you in the past, and you can walk free of this. In other words, what he's essentially saying, woman, you have been loose from this infirmity in the past because you have a covenant promise that you can be free from this. He's telling you, you have a right to be free 
from this. That did not get rid of it. And what does the passive voice mean? It's referring to something else which is talking about the covenant. And the reason we kind of even know that this, we'll jump down to here, because look what he said in verse 16. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? What's that all about? That's referring to the covenant, isn't it? A daughter of Abraham is being, hey, you're, you're a covenant person. You have a right according to the covenant. And the covenant was a promise of healing and deliverance in the Old Testament. It was there. But nobody could cast out the demons because nobody had authority to do it until Jesus came on the scene. But it was a covenant promise in the Old Testament. Being a daughter of Abraham, ought not this woman, she should be, it's necessary as a binding, as a, a right to be a daughter of Abraham, to be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day that Satan had bound for these 18 years. So, going back to this, what we're explaining to you is what's going on. You, one thing you've got to realize, you have a covenant right to get free of every evil spirit and every problem in your life because you are in covenant relationship with him. The covenant promises belong to us, and that's why you can get free of everything. Then he says, then he says, he laid his hands on her. Now, what did that do? That released power and anointing to flow into her. And what happened when he laid his hands on her? Immediately, she was made straight and glorified God. So that means that when he said, woman, you have been loosed in the past from your infirmity, that didn't get rid of it. What did get rid of it? When he laid his hands on her, immediately she was made straight. So what happened when he laid his hands on her? Did it just bring healing? No, remember, there was a demon in her, a spirit of infirmity that was in her. So somehow this thing had to get cast out. Well, we don't ever see him say, come out. But what did he do? He laid his hands on her. And what does that do? Laying hands on is a doctrine of the church that releases anointing and power into a person. And this is exactly what Jesus was doing. Here's an example of what happens when anointing is released. Acts 19.11, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. The hands of Paul. Something was going through his hands. So from his body were brought on the sick handkerchiefs for a or aprons, diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. That means his hands on these handkerchiefs or aprons transferred anointing and power into the aprons or the handkerchiefs, which when they were brought unto the sick, the anointing went into that person and the diseases departed out and the evil spirits left them. So what happened when Jesus laid his hands on this woman, as we see, he released anointing and power and that drove the demon out and brought a straightening of her. She was made straight and glorified God. In other words, we want you to understand what's been said. Because you don't get rid of the devils by just saying, you've been loose from something. You get rid of the devils by getting them cast out. And not only, you, how can you cast them out? Not only by commanding them to come out, but also through laying on of hands to release anointing and power will work also to drive evil spirits out. I've seen that happen lots of times. I remember people many times where you just lay hands on them and the demons start coming out of them before you start speaking. God's power would go into that person and they were starting to see the deliverance coming forth already. What you should be doing, by the way, is when you're ministering to people, you should be commanding demons to come out with your mouth, at the same time laying hands on them to release power and anointing to also not only cast the demons out, but also to release healing power to flow into them at the same time, because you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So you're, you should understand that, and that's where your faith should be. You're not just laying hands on people and thinking nothing's happening. Actively put your faith in operation, that you are releasing authority and anointing and power, not only to minister healing, but also to cast out the demons. That's a doctrine of the church, the laying on of hands, and a lot of people have not understood that. So that's what Jesus was doing. So, what you understand from this is evil spirits can be in you and cause these physical problems, and they got to be dealt with. 
you also have to understand, you've got a covenant right to be healed. The devil doesn't want you to know that. You've got to know your covenant. You've got to know you have covenant promises. And that actually, because of the covenant, you have been untied from all the works of the enemy, legally, from the covenant standpoint. And now, you just need to appropriate the promise of God through doing what the Word says, which is either casting out the demons or taking hold of healing, or in this case, laying hands on her, and it drove the demon out of the person because of the anointing that went forth. That's another thing that's important. Another thing that we see about how Satan works, so hopefully you've understood, just don't go around saying, well, I just lose you. I've had lots of, lots of people out there in the body of Christ ministers have said, well, I just go and just loose the evil spirits, thinking that they were on them from the outside. No, they have to be driven out and cast out. And that was not what was happening. It was a demon that was within the person, not on the outside of the person. We also see over in Luke chapter 14, the devil will also try to stop you from doing the things that God wants you to do. This is in Luke chapter 14. It said, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. He invited him to come, called him. Sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, or called, Come, for all things are now ready. They all with one consent began to make excuses. Now the one says, I bought a piece of ground, must needs go and see it, I pray they have me excused. You know, the other one says, I bought five oxen, a uh, uh, yoke of oxen, go to prove them, excuse. All these excuses. God does not want you to make any excuses for doing the word. The devil does. The devil put it in these guys' mind, well, I've got to do this thing first. No, you need to put God's word first place. You don't have any excuses that you put up before of why you can't do something. You can do everything that God wants you to do. The devil, what will he do? He'll try to give you excuses why you can't do it. He'll even say, well, you're not strong enough yet. Well, just go and start doing the Word, and that's how you're going to get strong as you apply your faith. Your faith's not strong enough. Well, start, how do you get your faith strong? By working it. Don't believe any of these lies or thinking that, you know, I don't know enough to be able to do these things. No. If the Word tells you to do it, you do it. The devil will try to make, give you excuses and lie in your mind or to get you to make excuses why you can't do something. Whatever God's told you to do, you do it. Don't ever let the enemy talk you out of it or deceive you through any kind of excuses. Another thing we have to realize, the devil demands to shake you and to do destructive works against you in your life. Luke twenty-two thirty-one, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, talking about Peter, behold, Satan has desired. The word desired is a form of the word iteo. It's a word ex iteo mai. And what's the word iteo? Making a demand. Satan has demanded to have you. He wants to destroy you. That he may sift you as wheat. He wants to destroy you and bring destruction against you. When he talks about sifting, this is a figurative word by inward agitation to try to one's faith to overthrow it. Hey, the devil wants to shake you. He wants to do anything if he can to overthrow your faith. He'll try every trick in the book that he knows to try to stop you from thinking that your faith will work. Don't ever fall for those tricks. You got the faith of Jesus. Your faith is able to conquer every enemy, cast out every devil, take hold of every promise. Your faith will produce results because you have the faith of Jesus. Don't let the devil try to overthrow your faith. Notice what Jesus said. I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. What does that mean? It's possible for your faith to fail. Why would your faith fail? Because you didn't work your faith. You didn't use your faith. You didn't do what was necessary to cause your faith to grow strong. Because what will your faith do? Your faith what you live by. Your faith will grow strong. In fact, the Bible says your faith will grow exceedingly. There's no limit. You, what are you supposed to do? That's why they said, hey, we need to get our faith strong. What do you tell them to do? Start applying it. Say to that sycamine tree, command it to be removed. Say to that mountain to be removed. 
In other words, the application of your faith, the working of your faith, causes your faith to grow strong. You make sure that your faith doesn't fail. Is it possible for your faith to fail? Yeah, because literally this is a subjunctive mood. He's literally saying that thy faith might not fail. It's not to fail, but it could fail. It all depends on whether you do what's necessary so it doesn't fail. Remember, you got the faith of Jesus. You got the spirit, same spirit of faith. Your faith will do the same thing that Jesus' faith did. You have the same spirit of faith as every one of us. Every one of us got the same. Don't ever doubt what you have. You have a spirit of faith that will release the power of God, that will conquer the enemies, that will take hold of the promise. Your faith that you work will see everything come to pass. So Satan, of course, he'll try to shake your faith, overthrow your faith, any way, anything that he can do to get to you. And he says, when you're converted, strengthen thy brethren, which means something. If your faith's going to be successful, just like he had to get strong, he's also saying, strengthen your brethren. What does it mean when it says strengthen your brethren? Make stable. Set fast. Make them firm. God wants you to get stable. He wants you to get set fast. He wants you to get so firm, nothing can shake you. You're strong. You're stable. You are so established in the Word. How do you get that way? By hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing the Word consistently. You work it. So just like, in it, how do you get stable in anything you do? Because you do it, you do it, you do it, you do it, you do it. And it's just like secondhand to you. You know it. You, it's working continually because you work it all the time. That's what he wants. He wants you to get to the place where your faith is stable, set fast, firmly established, and you are applying it, and your faith is growing strong, and you can conquer every enemy in your life. Now, what is the devil also? What else about the devil? How he works against you. John 8, 44. You're of the father of the devil. The lust of your father you'll do. He's a murderer from the beginning. Abode not in the truth. There's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He's a liar and the father of it. What does it say about the devil? He's a murderer. He wants to destroy. He wants to do evil things. He's a liar. You never can believe anything that he would tell you. That's why anybody that interrogates demons for information to think the cast out is totally off track it's wrong, it's sin, and furthermore, they're liars. They're going to deceive you. The devil also, he's just full of lust. He'll, get you, he'll try to deceive you to follow after the lusts of the flesh. And he abides not in the truth. Never listen to the devil and anything that he tells you. He's trying to deceive you. And how can I tell if it's the devil? Well, is it in line with the word or not? If it's not in line with the word, you know it's not the devil. Or if it's got some motivation that's contrary, like he, Jesus, remember when he was being tempted, and he said, oh, throw yourself down. Oh, the angels will have, you know, he quotes the scripture, the angels will bear you up. Ah, you're not going to tempt the Lord. He was trying to deceive him. He is a liar, and he is trying to deceive you. And what does he come to do? He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy. Does that mean he can do it? Not unless you let them. How do you know? Because the word steal here is in the subjunctive mood. It's not an infinitive as they've translated it. It shouldn't be translated that way. I like what Young's has done. Except that he might, may steal, or might steal. Same thing with kill. That he might kill, subjunctive mood. Or that he might destroy. You miss that whole point because you don't see it correctly because of the subjunctive mood of all three of those. The enemy, he doesn't, he, he doesn't have to steal, kill, or destroy in anybody's life if you meet the conditions and conquer him. God does not want any damage to come to you whatsoever. Jesus said that I am come that I might have life. And when he talks about coming to have life, you're going to have life. This is also subjunctive mood. I mean, it's conditional. It's not automatic. You've got to meet the conditions for this to happen. And furthermore, it's not just once in a while. This is a present tense verb. God wants, that means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. He wants you to continually 
have his life. And he wants you to have this life more abundantly. That's if you meet the conditions. You've got to do what he says. And God will bring forth his abundant life, which includes his healing, his deliverance, his peace, his prosperity, his victory, everything in your life. But it, that shows you that everything's conditional. You need to meet the conditions. If you're a doer of the word, God will accomplish it. Same thing. The devil can't get to you unless the conditions are met. If you don't give place to him, he's not going to get to you. You've got to learn to conquer him and overcome everything that he would come against, bring, bring against you. John 13, verse 2. The supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. That means the devil can bring things into your mind or into your heart. In this case, he put it in his heart. Why? He was listening, obviously, to the enemy's thoughts coming to him. And now he put it in his heart. Remember, the devil comes, and if you start listening to him, he'll keep coming. In this case, he certainly would have, first of all, brought a thought, and then he entertained that thought, and he gets to the place now, he's put it in his heart to want to betray him. The devil can put thoughts into your heart. You've got to be ready to take every thought captive and guard your heart with all diligence. He'll try to lie to you. He'll try to bring doubt to you. He'll try to give, get you to give up, or he'll try another way instead of trust God and do what his word says. <laughs> That's what most people do in the body of Christ. They try everything but what God wants. You know, most everybody that's come to me in the past for deliverance, they tried about everything else. And Well, I'm gonna, I've had people come in and say, well, I've tried everything else and thought I'd just try, I heard you talk about deliverance, we'll try this deliverance. I thought, well, why didn't you come and want to try that, do that first? <laughs> they tried every other thing, you know? They didn't have their, did they have their priorities right? No. Were they looking to God as their source? No, it's like, oh, well, I'll try this and nothing else has worked. That's a mistake. We need to make sure that we are guarding our heart. And the devil can bring lies into you. You've got to be ready to guard yourself. We see this in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He gave place to the enemy. You've got to guard yourself so you don't let the enemy come and have place in you. That's why it's mandatory for you to, to guard yourself, to have, uh, take your thoughts captive, make sure that you don't receive anything that's contrary to the truth of the word, regardless of what the situation is. The Acts 7, 15, 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. The devil would like you to resist what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Be ready to yield to the Holy Spirit. Be ready to follow what he's telling you to do. He is giving you the proper instructions, and we need to be led by the Holy Spirit and obey him. The devil will try to get you not to follow what the Holy Spirit wants, and he will always give you things in line with the Word. Remember, the Holy Spirit never originates anything. He shows the things above, takes the things above and shows them unto you. So they're always going to be in line with the Word. Anybody that ever brings something to you, if something comes to you and you think it's the Holy Spirit, but it's contrary to the Word, you know it's not the Holy Spirit. That's how cults have started and people have been deceived continually. Another thing we see of what the devil will do, Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. The word oppressed is a Greek word, kana donastuo. Donastuo is the word from dunamis, meaning power. Kata means having power against or power over. So here, the devil had power over the people, and he brought sickness and disease to them. And so what did Jesus do? He came and healed those who the devil had power over. And what do we see Jesus doing continually? He's either casting out the demons or releasing healing power to them and destroying the works of the enemy. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will operate through you, with, through the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Where does the power of God come from? You have a general spirit of power when you're born again, and you get specific power from the Word in you. The Word is the power of God that will bring forth the release of the power of God as Jesus would always speak things to release the power of God. As you speak the word, you will see that happen. 
Another thing what the devil will do is he will always try to get you to turn away from what is right. Acts chapter 13, verse 10. This is the one who was trying to lead the deputy of the country away from receiving the gospel, and Paul confronted this guy, and this is what, the, what he had said when he confronted him. Uh, he makes this statement. O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. The devil is an enemy of righteousness. That means he would like you to do anything but what is in line with righteousness. He'd like you to sin. That's unrighteousness. He'd like you to not obey the, the laws of the, of the New Testament. Lawlessness. Or, or not even obey the laws that out there in the nation. That's still lawlessness. God does not want us to be lawless or unrighteous. He said, You'll cease to, wilt, thou not, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? This word pervert means to try to distort, turn aside, or oppose. The devil will try to distort things so you don't get things straight, turn you aside and go some other direction, or oppose you even directly to try to stop you. Remember, he hindered, Satan came against Paul and said he hindered Paul so he didn't come to the church at Thessalonica when he won. said Satan hindered us. He'll oppose you and try to stop you. So Paul had to grow. He had to learn about what to do. He was getting buffeted by the enemy, you know, continually until he learned how to use his authority and start conquering the enemy. Well, it's the same thing with us. We've got to grow up and learn all these things. Anything that tries to steer you away from righteousness, contrary to the word, that's the devil working. Anything that tries to distort, turn aside, or oppose the right way of the Lord, that's the devil. Even if it's try some other way instead of doing God's way. I find many Christians, well, I'll try this way or that way, you know. I mean, like the one that says, well, food will heal you, you know. Just eat the right kind of foods. I've heard that for years from many, many Christians. If I just eat the right kind of foods, I know I'll get healed. Well, if this is a demonic spirit that came in because it's inherited generational or from your own sins, that's not going to get rid of your problem. You're dealing with things in the natural. You've got to cast out the spirit. See, this is just man's replacement for the power of God. We've got to do what God says instead of start looking to other ways. And that's what the world does. That's the world's answer for things, you know. That's not what you want to do. God will, if you aren't walking in the right ways of the Lord, is he going to manifest himself? No. Are you going to see God's power work, if you're, especially if you're trying six things at once? <laughs> not going to happen. You need to act on what the Word says and trust in the Lord and not get double-minded or trying everything and anything and I'll try casting out too kind of attitude. No, he will try to pervert the right ways of the Lord and try to deceive you. One other th scripture we'll look at before we close for tonight. The devil considers you sheep for the slaughter. That means he wants to destroy you. He wants to do destruction against you. Look what it says in Romans 8, 36. As it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. You're not to be slaughtered by the devil. You're not to see anything happen. What does he use? He tries to separate you from the love of Christ by using pressure, tribulation, distress, get you in all kinds of afflictions and calamities, persecution in some way, famine, whether it's natural or spiritual, so you're, you're not strong because you don't have the word in you, or nakedness, this would really be a spiritual revelation because if you're, not, if you're spiritually naked, that means you're not spiritually clothed. And if you're not spiritually clothed, are you going to have this power of God resident in you? Are you going to be strong to overcome? No. You've got to get spiritually clothed. Or peril, any kind of things, he can, dangers he can bring against you. Or sword, of course, evil, try to do evil things. It's happened in places of the world where Christians are getting persecuted and even killed. As it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. You've got to know you're more than a conqueror and you are able to overcome. This means, when we look at this, it really means to become completely victorious. It is a present tense, not a noun. It's a present tense verb. 
You are to become completely victorious and you are to conquer, to gain a surpassing victory and to absolutely conquer the enemy and see him be put underfoot. Doesn't matter what the enemy wants to bring forth, whether it's a natural thing, any of those things in the natural, or whether they were in the spiritual things coming against you. You can conquer and overcome you. The devil considers you sheep for the slaughter. No, we're not, gonna, we're not ever going to be afraid. You've got to stop fear. Fear will give place to the enemy. You've got to always be in faith and know what God will do. I said that was the last, but we'll give you one more. Romans 16, 20, and this is a good one to end up on. What will God do to the enemy? The God of peace shall crush, bruise, break, break in pieces, tread down. He's going to crush the enemy under your feet. That's because you are going to use the authority and he's going to accomplish this in your life. When it says shortly, the word shortly doesn't mean a talking about a time. Oh, I, I, yeah, I like it to be shortly, quick time. No, it's not talking about that in a sense. It's talking about how he comes to deal with the enemies because you may have a long time of getting rid of all the enemies, let's say casting them all out. It's a word en, and there's another Greek word under it, which is a word takos, which means with quickness and speed. It's not talking about a length of time. It's talking about how God does things when you bring him on the scene. He does it with quickness and speed. He attacks immediately. Every time you put him in operation, he is on the scene with quickness and speed to come against the enemy, to crush him under your foot. Otherwise, he's not on a vacation. I've got to kind of get God doing something. He's on now. He is ready. When you speak, he's on. When you get, do something, God is working immediately. With quickness and speed, he will come against your enemies and he will work to crush them and bruise them under your feet. What does that mean? You've got to get confidence in God. And you've got to realize it's going to be destruction of the enemy. You are going to take it to the enemy and destroy his works by casting out all the demons, by destroying every one of everything that he has done. You are a evil spirit destroyer, a devil destroyer. You are going to destroy every bit of his works and see him be crushed under your feet with quickness and speed. This really would mean quickness, with quickness and speed as you do what the word says. God will give you the victory. So even Satan, he's got all these works against us. The bottom line is you got Jesus. You got the spirit of faith. You got the same spirit of faith. You got authority. You got power. You got the name of Jesus. You got the Holy Spirit ready to work. You got the angels that are going to perform the word of God and bring these things forth. And you got the promise that God will crush Satan under your feet with quickness and speed as you put him in operation in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of the workings of Satan that would come against me. I thank you. I will make sure I do not let the enemy <coughs> take the word out of my heart. I will be fruitful. I will do what the word says. I will make sure my faith grows continually and it does not fail. It conquers the enemy. I will never listen to any of his lies. I will not allow any of his lying thoughts to come into me. I thank you, Lord, that I will walk in the ways of righteousness and obedience to the word, and I will not let him de to deter me from doing what God wants, even though he comes to oppose me. He cannot steal, kill, or destroy unless the conditions are met. I will smite the enemy. I will cast out the devils. I will release the power of God. I will destroy the works of the enemy as I do what the word says. I will see you, the God of peace, bruise, crush the devil under my feet with quickness and speed because I am a doer of the word. I will never believe anything he tells me. I will never give up 
I will never doubt. I will watch and pray. I will do what the Word says. And I am more than a conqueror. I will be completely victorious over every work of the enemy. I thank you, Lord, for the authority, the power of God, the Word of God, the faith of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the angels of God, performing the Word. Greater are you in me than he that's in the world. I will conquer every work of the enemy, and he will not be successful ever against me. My faith will not fail. I will get strengthened, stable, steadfast, set firm, and I will grow exceedingly in my faith. And my faith is the victory that overcomes the enemy in all areas. Thank you, Lord, for giving me victory and crushing the enemy under my feet with quickness and speed because I'm a hearer and a doer of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God will give you the victory. But you've got to know what the enemy's up to so you don't fall for him. Father, we thank you for more that we have brought forth this night from the Word. We thank you. We see how the enemy works. We also see how you work. We see how we can conquer everything. We've got to make sure we don't give place to them. And we're going to meet the conditions. Thank you as we're hearers and doers of this Word. We will see all of the works of the enemy destroyed in our life. Thank you for bringing your promises and thank you for much fruit and your blessings that are going to come forth as we walk in your ways and see total victory, completely victorious in everything in our life. We praise you for bringing it to pass. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.